you apply to Ezra Booking Office. So now let me introduce today's lecturer, Lynn, Lynn Julius, who has very kindly agreed to, this, to give us this lecture from London, as she was unable to come to Israel this year for obvious reasons. Although there were many trips planned, but none was, well, none was able to be, be fulfilled. Lynn is, is British born, the daughter of Iraqi Jewish refugees. She graduated in international business relations from the University of Sussex and is a widely read journalist and blogger. Now, Lynn is the co-founder of Harif, which is an association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa in England, in, in the UK. Harif arranges talks and film screenings, which are now shown on the internet. And I think they're shown weekly. Lynn will talk about that later. Um, Harif also advocates for the rights of Jewish ex-refugees ex from Arab countries and Iran. And her book, Uprooted, uh, how 3,000 years of Jewish civilization in the Arab world vanished overnight, was published in 2018. So now let's go straight to our subject for today. Lynn, over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Susan. And it's, it's a great pleasure to be with you all. I wish I was there in person. Uh, it's a very gray, dull, cold day here in London, and, and we're in dire need of some Israeli sunshine and warmth. <laughs> uh, so, um, as, as Susan said, I, um, I run an organization called Harif, um, and we have been doing a very busy program of, of Zoom lectures. You're all invited to attend. It's usually on a Tuesday, but it won't clash with uh, the Ezra activities, uh, I'm glad to tell you, because uh, we do ours usually on uh, 7 or 7.30 in the evening. And, and I urge you all to, to subscribe to the Harif uh, mailing list. You don't have to be a Jew from an Arab country. You just have to be interested in the subject matter. Um, and we've been doing, I think we've done about 37 of these uh, lectures since the beginning of the crisis. Anyway, to move on to the subject of today's talk, it's the Arabs and the Holocaust. And uh, the question I want to ask today is what impact did World War II have on Jewish communities in the Arab world? To what extent uh, was the Arab world influenced by the Nazis? And is the legacy of Nazism still with us today in the Arab world? So a few years ago, Lawrence and I went to the Holocaust Museum in Berlin. And as you know, there is a memorial, uh, there, there is a museum in the center of Berlin. And on the plaque outside, it says, Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. There is a common misperception that the Holocaust affected only Jews in Europe. But there were, of course, Sephardi communities wiped out by the Nazis, for instance, in Salonika and the Balkans. But as I shall show, the Jews in the Middle East and North Africa were also affected. And we are all impacted today by an ideology born in the Nazi era. Lawrence? <laughs> Sorry about this. It is not moving. Hang on one sec. There we go. So this is the villa south of Berlin uh, at Wannsee, where the Nazi high command met to agree the final solution in January 1942. Now they went through every Jewish community in the world and uh, the, they came up with figures for each one. And the figure for France was 700,000. But that's a bit strange because there were no more than about 400,000 
uh, Jews living in France. So this figure of 700,000 must have incorporated uh, the Jews in the French uh, protectorates of North Africa and in Algeria, which was then considered part of uh, metropolitan France. And so we know that the Nazis had a plan to exterminate the Jews of the Middle East and North Africa and uh, wipe out all Jews wherever they lived in the world. But their aim was thwarted by the Battle of El Alamein in late uh, 1942, when the German general Rommel was defeated by the allies. And Churchill said of this battle, now this is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So how did the Holocaust affect the Jews of the Middle East and North Africa? Well, some 4,000 Jews died during World War II, but mostly as a result of Allied bombing. And uh, that tally really is a drop in the ocean compared to uh, the terrible losses in Europe and six million Jews. You just cannot make the comparison. Having said that, there were about 2,000 Jews from Middle East and North African countries living in Europe, uh, mainly in France. And they were very much affected by the Holocaust. And the two figures you see on the screen were both uh, sports champions. Uh, one was a Tunisian flyweight uh, boxing champion called Young Perez. And he was sent to Auschwitz during the war. He actually survived Auschwitz only to die on the death march um, at the end. And the other man you see was a swimming champion called Alfred Nakash. And he was born in Constantine in Algeria. And he started to learn to swim because he had a fear of water. And he became so good at it, he became a champion. He moved to France uh, and in 19, I think it was in 1942 or 1943, uh, the Nazis started rounding up the Jews in Toulouse where he lived with his wife and child. He tried to escape into Spain, but his child was so upset she would, wouldn't stop crying. And so they turned back and went back to France. And then they were all deported to Auschwitz. His wife and daughter died. He survived in the camp. Actually, the Nazis uh, made him dive in dirty water and retrieve objects for sport. Anyway, he survived Auschwitz. And three years after the end of the war, he actually participated in the Olympic Games. A, a really remarkable man. And uh, swimming pools in France are still named after him today, Alfred Nakash. Lawrence is doesn't work. Okay. It doesn't work on here. Yeah, okay. Could you touch right, so. So back to uh, North Africa. In uh, May 1940, the Jews invaded France and the Vichy regime, which was a pro-Nazi regime, was installed in North Africa. Uh, the protectorates of Morocco and Tunisia and uh, the um, colony, I think you can call it, of Algeria, all got uh, the uh, Vichy government. Now the Vichy regime uh, set up a special department for the control of the Jewish problem. And soon it imposed a set of anti-Jewish laws called the Statut des Juifs. And these laws were passed by the Vichy government and were often more stringent than anything that the Nazis implemented.
So let's look at Algeria. Algeria had 100,000 Jews. Now these Jews had French citizenship. They'd had uh, citizenship since 1870 uh, by decree. And that decree was called the Decret Crémieux after the uh, politician who gave them the citizenship. So the Decret Crémieux was abrogated and the Jews were stripped of their citizenship. Quotas for schools were introduced. Jews were sacked from public service, trade, banking, the media, medicine, law, and the professions. And their assets were put in trust. And th that was really the first stage to confiscation. To their credit, uh, mosques told their flocks not to take advantage of their fellow Algerians. So what was the situation in Morocco? Well, Morocco had 230,000 Jews. Uh, here too, the Statut des Juifs was applied by the Vichy regime, which was headed by General Nogues. But the head of state was uh, the Sultan, the future Muhammad V. Now there is a, a legend about uh, the Sultan that he saved the Jews. And we've been uh, reading a lot about this lately now that um, uh, there is a peace deal between Israel and Morocco. People say the Moroccan king stopped the Jews from being deported to concentration camps. And they even say he wore the yellow star. And in fact, not just that, but he asked for 20 more for his family. Uh, it is true that the Moroccan Sultan was pro-Jewish. I mean, Moroccan kings always prided themselves in, in being the protectors of the Jews. And he did meet with Jews in Morocco and he reassured them uh, that he was on their side. But historians now affirm that he signed every single anti-Jewish decree. And in fact, power did not rest in his hands. Uh, it was really with General Nogues of the Vichy regime. But restrictions were not as rigidly enforced and uh, converts to Islam were excluded. Uh, there was a rat line for refugees from Europe to go to the US. And those of you who've seen the film Casablanca will remember uh, Rick's Bar, where these uh, refugees would, would congregate. And that incredible scene where they all stand up to sing the Marseillaise when, when the Germans come in. There was a remarkable Jewish woman lawyer called Hélène Cazès Benatar, who actually helped these refugees. And she worked throughout the war to help them get, um, get onto uh, boats headed for uh, the US uh, and, and other parts of the world. Um, now, what happened to the Jews in Morocco? Well, Jews were actually shunted back into the ghettos because they had been living in the new European quarters of Moroccan uh, cities, but now they had to move back. And these ghettos were overcrowded, they were unsanitary and disease was rampant. There were also quotas on schools and jobs and Jews were not allowed into public spaces such as parks and cinemas. And in recent years, actually, uh, Moroccan Jews have received uh, compensation uh, for these hardships. Now, it's not really well known that there were labor camps um, on Moroccan soil up to 60 of them, and between 14,000 and 15,000 Jewish men, women, and children were interned. And of those, about 2,000 Moroccan Jews of British nationality were also interned. 
men were sent to forced labor camps. Um, one, Bergent, which is in the north of, um, of, your, of the map, was actually exclusively Jewish, and there were over 400 Jews there. So the inmates in these camps were a mixture of political prisoners, uh, Spanish communists um, co who were fleeing Franco, uh, soldiers of the defeated French army, and uh, refugees who were, who were fleeing across Morocco, um, who, were, who were then detained in, in the camps. The conditions were absolutely atrocious. Um, the inmates were sometimes tortured or punished. There was one terrible punishment which involved um, digging a ditch for the prisoner, putting him um, in, in that ditch as if he was in a grave and leaving him there uh, day and night. And as you know, the desert temperatures could be up to 100 degrees in, in the day, and uh, the temperatures could fall to about 32 degrees at night. And these prisoners would be left without uh, much food or water. And obviously dozens must have died. In fact, so terrible were the conditions that I read last week uh, that there was a report that uh, prisoners were going to be sent from France to these camps in Morocco, but so notorious was their reputation that the prisoners refused to go. And in fact, they, 150 of them uh, were shot. And this is another picture of the labor camps. Now they weren't even fenced in because you know, if you tried to escape one of these camps, you'd be in the middle of the desert and you'd probably die. Um, and so there was absolutely no point. It's another picture. Right. Um, November 1942, the Allies were victorious at the Battle of El Alamein and started preparing a landing in North Africa. This was called Operation Torch. Uh, now Operation Torch took place on the 8th of November, 1942, and the allies were about to land in the port of Algiers. There were resistance fighters in uh, the city uh, about 377 of them who tried to help uh, the allies. Uh, and of them, 315 were Jews. Overnight, they took control of strategic points in Algiers, for instance, the police station, the army headquarters, the governor's residence, um, and these people had uh, very little training. They had antiquated arms and they had no uniforms, but they managed to hold out until the allies actually arrived in Algiers. And they even impersonated the uh, Vichy um, governor at one stage and used all sorts of ruses and not a shot was fired and the, and the Americans walked in. Uh, but the uh, restrictions that the Jews were under stayed in place for almost a year and uh, French citizenship was not restored to them uh, until the end of 1943. So at this point, the Nazis decided to regroup and they responded by occupying Tunisia. And this was to drive a wedge between Algeria and Libya. And so in November, 1942, the Nazis entered Tunis and Tunisia came under direct Nazi control for six months. 
Now, the Vichy rules in Tunisia had not been so rigorously applied. In fact, the French uh, resident general was a practicing Christian. His name was uh, Admiral Esteva, and he delayed implementing the rules as much as possible. But after November 1942, Walter Ralph was in charge. Now, Walter Ralph was the SS um, man who'd invented the mobile gas ban, and that was responsible for killing 100,000 Jews in Eastern Europe. And there was a plan to do the same in Tunisia. So Ralph, Ralph headed an SS death squad, um, the Einsatzgruppen uh, Egypten, and uh, they had a plan for the mass killing of Jews in Palestine and the Arab world. Tunisian Jews had their property seized and they were marched off. Here you see them in the, with their pickaxes and their shovels. They were marched off to labor camps and about 5,000 Jews were sent to labor camps in Tunisia. Uh, a Juden, Judenrat or Jewish council was set up to organize the recruitment of these Jews. Ralph actually asked permission to exterminate the Jews of Cairo next door to Tunisia, but Rommel said no. So throughout the spring of 1943, the allies advanced on Tunisia. Ralph described the mood in his diary he said, the Jews are hopeful, the Arabs depressed. So, an American called Robert Satlov wrote a book examining the long reach of the Holocaust into Arab lands. Here he is, and this is his book. Um, it's called Among the Righteous. And Robert Satloff actually spent three years in uh, North Africa. And what he wanted to do was um, try to find Arabs who helped Jews during the war so that he could, you know, create some kind of empathy um, and also combat this tide of Holocaust denial that you find in Arab countries. Um, uh, but he does write that a lot of popular feeling in Arab countries was pro-German. And here's a quote from his book. As Jews went to labor camps in Tunisia, gestures of support and active assistance for the minority being displaced, disenfranchised, plundered and conscripted into forced labor were very rare. Arab passers-by would publicly insult and physically attack individuals. So Satlov looked for Arabs who rescued Jews and he found stories of persecution and he found stories of rescue. But most Arabs were indifferent to what was happening to the Jews and not many Arabs had wanted to be found and not many Jews had wanted to find them either. At the end of the day, Satloff found only four candidates, uh, the King of Morocco, the Bay of Tunis, uh, a man called Khalid Abdul Wahad, which I'll tell you about in a minute, and uh, the rector of the Paris mosque, Sikador Ben Gabrit, who wasn't even in North Africa. So this is Khalid Abdul Wahad, who was a candidate to be a righteous Gentile. Now he was a, a Tunisian aristocrat and he had a farmhouse just outside Tunis. And uh, when the Germans occupied Tunisia, they had their eye on uh, a Jewish family which had some uh, um, pretty, pretty girls in it. And um, Khalid Abdul Wahad actually uh, got the, sheltered these, this, this family in his farmhouse. 
um, and protected them from the Nazis. Uh, but um, when he was put forward as a candidate to be righteous Gentile to Yad Vashem, Yad Vashem actually turned him down and they said he hadn't actually risk his life, which was one of the criteria for being a righteous Gentile. And in fact, they said that the Nazis knew very well what was happening. Um, and so, you know, they, they turned him down. Now, what was happening in Libya there? Uh, of course, the Italian fascists had been in control and Mussolini passed the race laws in 1938. Um, 870 Jews of British nationality were in fact deported to Bergen-Belsen. Uh, but as it happened quite late in the war, most of these did survive. And here you see a picture of some of the Libyan Jews returning to Tripoli after the war and you can just make out a Union Jack on the railway carriage there and that was because they were of British nationality and many of them were um, used in prison exchanges um, while they were in in Europe but in Libya itself uh, there were work camps there was a notorious uh, con uh, work camp called Jado which was southwest of the capital Tripoli, about 2000 uh, Libyan Jews were interned there. And of those 600 died of a disease or starvation. So what was happening in Egypt? Well, there were about uh, 100,000 Jews in Egypt. Now, Egypt was very much the front line between the Allies and the Nazis, and uh, the front line shifted back and forth during 1941 and into 1942. But there was a very real fear amongst the Jews that uh, Egypt would fall to the Nazis. Um, popular feeling was also very pro-German, and the king, this is a picture of King Farouk, he wrote a letter to Hitler, actually declaring his support and saying 90% of the Egyptians were pro-Nazi. The Jews of Alexandria, which was on the coast, actually fled to Cairo, which was further south. And the Jews of Cairo fled to Old Cairo uh, or Fostat, because they felt a bit safer there. Um, there was a rumor that the Nazis had drawn up a blacklist of Jewish businessmen, and a few of those did try and leave Egypt. Uh, some of them ended up in South Africa, uh, and some in Sudan. Uh, but of course, El Alamein was, was the turning point. Um, there was also the, just a minute. There's also the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And actually the Muslim Brotherhood, I'll tell you about them a bit later, uh, but they had actually been founded in uh, 1928 by an Egyptian called Hassan al-Bana. Uh, and by the end of the war, they had a million men under arms and during the 1930s, they were already inciting violence against the Jews and the Copts of, of Egypt. So moving on to the Levant, there was a very strong current of pro-Nazism and anti-Semitism. And here you see the flag of the Syrian Socialist National Party, which was very much influenced by Nazism. And what they wanted to do was overthrow the, uh, the French uh, colonial regime in, uh, in Syria and have an independent Arab state. And uh, this was really a blood and soil party that eventually wanted to exclude anyone who was not Arab and, and not Muslim. 
And at the same time, there was the Bath Party, which was also influenced by the Nazis. And here you see a quote from um, Samir al-Jundi of the, of the Syrian uh, Bath Party. He said, we were racists. We admired the Nazis. Anyone who lived in Damascus at the time was, so I can't quite read this, was witness to the Arab inclination to Nazism. And both these parties still exist today. As you know, President Assad in Syria is the head of the Syrian Ba'ath Party. And uh, the Syrian Socialist National Party is still active in Lebanon as well as Syria. Uh, demonstrators in Aleppo in Syria chanted, no more monsieur, no more mister, in heaven Allah, on earth Hitler. And Hitler was Hajj Hitler or Muallam Hitler. In Palestine, the German consul in Jerusalem, Walter Dole, wrote in 1937, Palestinian Arabs in all social strata have great sympathies for the new Germany and the Führer. If a person identified himself as a German when faced with threats from an Arab crowd, this alone generally allowed him to pass freely. But when some identified themselves by making the Heil Hitler salute, in most cases, the Arabs attitude became expressions of open enthusiasm. So the Nazis were emulated across the Arab world and there were paramilitary youth groups like Young Egypt and the Futuwa in Iraq who held torchlight processions and were even invited to take part in the Nuremberg rallies. I mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood uh, which was founded in Egypt by the gentleman in the Fez, Hassan al-Bana. And um, basically that movement was a political movement to reestablish the caliphate, which had come to, the end, uh, come to an end at the end of the uh, First World War. And anti-Semitism was really at the very heart of their uh, ideology not just because um, of the tensions that were rising in Palestine between Jews and Arabs, but because Jews represented everything uh, that the Muslim Brotherhood hated most. And the Muslim Brotherhood imported uh, ideas of anti-Semitism from Europe and from Nazism. Um, and they imagined that the Jews wanted to uh, dominate the world and had to be fought at all costs. And uh, soon they entered into a kind of alliance uh, with the Germans who began to uh, finance the activities of the Muslim Brotherhood during the 1930s. And here you see a picture of uh, Fritz Grober, who was the German ambassador to Baghdad. And the Germans had their secret agents who were intriguing right across the Arab world and trying to ferment uh, an uprising against the British and the French. And um, the third, per the third party in this alliance was of course the Palestinian Mufti Hajamin Haj al-Husseini. And the Germans financed his activities too. They financed the Arab revolt of 1936. And um, ideas began to penetrate, anti-Semitic ideas began to penetrate the Arab world. And here you see Mein Kampf, which was translated into Arabic and serialized in Arabic newspapers. Now for many Arabs, being on the side of the Nazis was a practical anti-colonial alliance against the British and the French. And the Jews were seen as collaborators with the colonialists. And people generally did believe that the Nazis would win the war in 1941, and they wanted to back the winning side. 
Arabs in Jerusalem began to state their claims on Jewish property in early 1941. So they would write on the walls, you know, this is, this is for Ahmed and this is for Muhammad. Uh, and the, the, the Jews genuinely believed, the Jews in Palestine genuinely believed the Nazis would win. And they, were, they even made plans for their evacuation. In uh, May 1941, there was a massacre in Tunisia of, of eight Jews. In Iraq, which had 150,000 Jews, there was a particularly virulent form of nationalism. Uh, the British and the French had thwarted Arab aspirations for a pan-Arab kingdom in Damascus. And Faisal, who was um, who'd been brought from Arabia to become king of Syria, king of this new uh, pan-Arab kingdom, uh, was deeply disappointed because he was denied the throne of Syria and he was given the throne of Iraq in 1921 instead. But when Faisal came into Iraq to become uh, the king there, he brought with him certain Syrian nationalists. For instance, a man called Sati al-Husri. And Sati al-Husri actually brought with him some very anti-Semitic ideas. And during the 1920s, he started inciting anti-Semitism against the Jews in Baghdad. And um, the uh, nationalists in Iraq actually um, took up important posts in the Iraqi government, for instance, in the Ministry of Education, where they could influence uh, children. And um, in Iraq during the 1930s, there was a rise of uh, pro-Nazi sentiment um, and that became worse, really, with, with um, when King Faisal died and, uh, and the new king, his son Ghazi, came to power in 1933, and he was actually a pro-Nazi, and he surrounded himself uh, with pro-Nazi Iraqis. And my mother tells the story that... Um, my mother who was growing up in Baghdad at the time, they had a gardener uh, who lived in a shed at the bottom of the garden and uh, the wife had a baby and my mother asked her um, what was his name? And uh, she turned around and said, Hitler. Uh, of course it wasn't really Hitler, but she knew how to, uh, how, how to needle my mother. So this was a gardener actually working for a, a Jewish family just goes to show the, the actual strength of pro-Nazi feeling at that time. And um, this is a picture of Iraqis in 1932, which was the year that Iraq been uh, declared, sorry, declared its independence. Um, and they, they're all making the uh, fascist salute. So the Mufti, uh, the Palestinian Mufti is really the person who introduced ideological hatred of the Jews into Islam. And the Jews became the ep epitome of evil. And later when he was broadcasting anti-Jewish propaganda from Berlin, he said, kill the Jews wherever you find them. This pleases God, history and religion. Now, between 1939 and 1941, after the failure of the Arab revolt in Palestine, the Mufti was exiled to Baghdad by the British. He never ceased to plot the overthrow of the pro-British government. Finally, he and a pro-Nazi group of politicians, led by a man called Rashid al-Ghalani and a group of pro-Nazi army officers, finally succeeded in overthrowing the pro-British government. 
the pro-Nazi government barely lasted two months from April to the end of May, 1941. It was the only Arab government to sign a military pact with the Axis powers. Britain declared war against the pro-Nazi government, obviously fearful for the oil reserves in, um, in Iraq. During April and May, 1941, there was fierce incitement against the Jews and there were anti-Jewish propaganda broadcasts um, and Jews locked themselves in their homes. Eventually, the leaders of the pro-Nazi government were put to flight. The Mufti fled and ended up in Berlin. He was not the only one. There were 60, including Rashid al-Gilani, Fauzi al-Kawakji, Abu Ibrahim al-Kabir, Hassan Salama, Arif Abdal Rafiq, Rasim Khalidi, and Wasaf Kamal. And the Mufti spent the rest of the war in Berlin broadcasting anti-Jewish propaganda and doing his best to help exterminate Jews. But not before he managed to lay the groundwork for a terrible massacre in Baghdad uh, called the Farhud. And the Farhud is an Arabic term for forced dispossession. It happened on the 1st and uh, 2nd of June, 1941. 180 Jews were killed, possibly more. We will probably never know the final tally. Some historians put it at 600 Jews killed. Uh, we won't know because some were thrown in the river, whole families were, uh, were killed and there was no one to witness their killing. Uh, anyway, 180 identified Jews. Uh, are known to have been killed. 900 homes were destroyed. A thousand people were wounded. There was terrible rape and uh, looting. And the Jews of Baghdad, who actually uh, made up about a third of the city, had never seen anything like it. Now, the question is, was, was the Farhud a Holocaust event? And recently, a case was heard in the Israeli courts where uh, survivors of the Farhud claimed that the Farhud was uh, a Holocaust event and they, they should be entitled to reparations. But the judges decided that it was not a Holocaust event, it was just another pogrom uh, that erupted from time to time uh, in, in the Arab world. Now the case, um, I think, has gone to the appeal court. So I think the survivors are gonna try again uh, to win their case. Uh, but they actually claim that Nazi propaganda played, played a very big role in uh, causing uh, this, this pogrom. Um, the self-styled Nazi governor of Baghdad uh, who was a man called Al Sabawi, summoned the chief rabbi of Baghdad, Sassoon Khaduri, to see him just before the Farhud broke out. And he apparently told the Jews to stay in their homes and pack enough food for three days. So it is thought that um, there was a plan to deport the Jews to concentration camps in the desert. Now, this man here is called Daniel Sasson, and he was interviewed uh, recently, and he actually said that while the pro-Nazi government was in power in, uh, in, in Iraq, uh, a ghetto was set up in a town called Diwaniya, which is uh, on the Euphrates River. He was five years old at the time, but his family uh, were in this ghetto, and they were surrounded by guards and the, and the men were sent to do forced labor. And so it's thought that uh, the Diwaniya ghetto was really the first stage 
in uh, the roundup of the Jews of Iraq, which might well have uh, ended in uh, their, their ex extermination. And this is a picture of uh, the Mufti together with Rashid Ali Al Ghulani, who was uh, the prime minister at the time of the pro-Nazi government. And uh, the picture below shows you the mass grave uh, that contained the bodies of uh, the Farhud victims. So another reason why the Farhud should be considered a Holocaust event is, is the Mufti's famous meeting with Hitler in November 1941. And there the Mufti asked Hitler's permission uh, for the Mufti to manage the extermination of the Jews wherever they were in, in the Arab world, not just in Palestine. But we do know that there were plans to set up concentration camps, uh, sorry, gas chambers in the Dotan Valley in Israel. Uh, but uh, the Mufti really had plans uh, to exterminate the Jews outside Palestine as well. It, it is often said the Mufti's alliance with the Nazis was a pragmatic one. He just wanted to get rid of the British. Uh, but I would argue that it was an ideological one, that the Mufti would not have stopped short of exterminating the Jews once the Allies had been defeated. Uh, while he was in Berlin, the Mufti set up Muslim SS divisions in Bosnia and Yugoslavia. And here you see the uh, Muslim soldiers at prayer. Now he was never tried as a war criminal after the war. In fact, he was treated as a hero throughout the Arab world until his death in uh, 1974. And you could argue that he was even more zealous uh, than the Nazis, and he was responsible for perhaps 20,000 uh, Jewish deaths. And uh, I do believe he's still a hero for, for many Palestinians, or, although they try very hard to hide this fact. Now, in 1945, obviously the war ended, uh, but barely six months after the end of the war, uh, a terrible riot erupted in, uh, in, in Libya against the Jews, uh, and 130 Jews were killed in that episode. And there were also disturbances in Egypt, and the Ashkenazi synagogue was, was destroyed. Um, and this seems to point to um, the influence of Nazi propaganda or you know, pro-Nazi feeling. Um, even though the Nazis had been defeated, there was still a great deal of anti-Jewish feeling in the Arab world. And it's also a fact that perhaps this propaganda this radio propaganda had managed to brainwash a lot of, uh, a lot of Arabs who were illiterate and easily uh, swayed. Um, in 1940, uh, 1945, the Arab League was set up. And uh, of course, things were really hotting up in Palestine. Uh, but the Arab League drafted a series of laws that were really designed to persecute the, the Jews who actually lived in Arab countries. And it's uncanny how similar these laws are to the Nuremberg laws. So the Jews were going to be stripped of their nationality, or they were going to be considered the Jewish minority of Palestine, basically, even though they were citizens of these Arab countries, 
they were going to be considered as enemy aliens. So the restrictions included um, uh, business and property ownership um, restrictions and depossession, dispossession, economic boycotts, uh, the freezing of bank accounts, exclusion from public service jobs. Um, the, the Jews would not be allowed to leave. They would be hostages to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And lastly, Zionism would become a crime. And shortly afterwards, uh, there was a mass exodus of uh, Jews from Arab countries uh, against a backdrop of terrible violence and hundreds of, of Jews were killed. Um, but Israel managed to uh, rescue quite a few of these Jews. They organized airlifts uh, from Yemen and from Iraq particularly and uh, many Jews managed to leave. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood I, I mentioned before um, actually saw a great increase in its influence in, in the Arab world. And I think you can say that, uh, the, that both the Muslim Brotherhood and the Palestinian Mufti um, introduced a kind of Islamized anti-Semitism. Um, and anti-Semitism was, as I mentioned, at the core of the Muslim Brotherhood's philosophy. Um, and Jews were really considered the epitome of evil. And this was really in contrast to the traditional Islamic view of the Jew instead of being held in contempt as uh, rather defenseless uh, dhimmis, that's second class to Muslims, um, they, were, they were being hated. And this really is a European idea, you know, that the Jews uh, should be hated because they're considered to be all powerful and want to dominate the world. Uh, but the Muslim Brotherhood also uh, hated Jews because they represented modernity, they represented civil rights and women's rights and minority rights. And the Muslim Brotherhood introduced this idea uh, that violence is a, is a religious mandated duty. Um, and they opened the way to mass slaughter, not just of non-Muslims, but Muslims as well. And in the 1950s, there began what Bernard Lewis calls the war against the Jews, um, and a great increase in anti-Semitism in, in the Arab world. Um, the, there was a, um, a man called Said Qutb, who was really the, uh, the ideologue of the Muslim Brotherhood, and he wrote a book called The Struggle Against the Jews, or, sorry, Our War Against the Jews. And uh, at the time, uh, Nazi criminals sought shelter in the Arab world. Here's one of them, Alois Brunner, who, uh, who ended up in Syria and died there in 2010. But there were dozens, maybe even hundreds of ex-Nazi uh, war criminals who actually were welcomed into the Arab world and they, uh, they helped uh, pursue an anti-Semitic campaign and spread, uh, spread anti-Semitism in, uh, in the Arab countries. And even today, anti-Semitism pervades uh, the Arab world. Uh, and I think we could say that the intellectual godfather of the Islamist or Islamofascist uh, Islam movements we have today in the world was the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, Adolf Eichmann in his memoirs, he considered the Arabs as the heirs to the Nazis. Uh, and he says in his memoirs, I have not managed to complete my task of total annihilation, but I hope the Muslims will complete it for me.
So Islamic State or Daesh, uh, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, really they do have the Muslim Brotherhood as their uh, intellectual uh, underpinning, if you like. Um, we know Abu Bag Bakr al-Baghdadi was the head of, um, of Islamic State and who was recently uh, killed. He was also a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, Hamas is the Gaza branch of the Mo Muslim Brotherhood. You only have to read the Hamas charter to see that its ideology is pervaded by European anti-Semitic theories of Jewish power. Uh, for instance, that the Jews started the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. And this is straight out of the protocols of the elders of Zion or Mein Kampf. Now it's true that the Saudis have financed the spread of the Muslim Brotherhood ideology uh, and the jihadist doctrine is often called Salafist, uh, but there has been a cross-pollination between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists. And from a theological movement about the relationship of the Muslim and his God, it's become a political movement and anti-Semitism is really at its core. The flag you see here actually says, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Had there been Jews in Northern Iraq uh, when uh, Daesh or Islamic State was on the rampage there uh, after 2014, they would certainly have been killed and their women and children sold into slavery just like the Yazidis were. Uh, the defeat of Islamic State on the ground has not uh, removed the threat. Thousands of jihadis are losing, loose in the West. And the legacy of an ideology born in the Nazi era, let's call it Islamofascism, is still with us today. Even though moderate states such as the UAE uh, and Bahrain have, and Morocco have made peace uh, with Israel, there are still extremist regimes around, influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, Qatar and Kuwait. Of course, we know that Iran actually still has uh, genocide as one of its uh, main aims when it comes to Israel and, and they are deep into Holocaust denial. So um, on that rather pessimistic note, I will, I will finish there. Very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Can we go, how do we go back to the video? Can we, I'm just going back. Yeah, you thank you so much, Lynn. We've got quite yeah. a lot of questions, I think. Yes. And um, so, Roz. Yes, okay. Um, so we have a question here. Was there a pattern of collaboration by local populations similar to the collaboration in Europe? And how important was this in allowing the Nazis to pursue their final solution? Right, well, um, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to answer because actually uh, the Muslims in North Africa were not in control of their destiny. Uh, but there were instances of individuals being denounced. In fact, there was a terrible case in uh, Tunisia, I think, of, uh, of Jews actually being deported and, um, and beheaded uh, by the Nazis after they'd been denounced uh, by, by a Tunisian Muslim. So there were instances like that, but I, I'd say, generally speaking, the Arabs were, um, were kind of passive and they were kind of witnesses to what was, what was going on really. Um, and um, in, in Iraq, obviously, which was already independent, they took a much more active uh, role to the extent that there was actually a, a pro-Nazi government there. Um, but uh, I think that that's, really all one can say uh, about it, yeah. Okay, 
So we have now two or three questions basically on the same, but I'll, I'll ask them. Uh, Steve Friedman says, the Arabs were inclined to Nazism, but how did the Nazis regard the Arabs? Now, before you answer, David Raffel says, how did the Nazis square their pure Aryan philosophy with yeah. their connection to the non-Aryan Arab world? So, yeah, there you are. That's right. Well, they're absolutely right. Uh, at the start um, of the 1930s, and um, the Nazis actually did regard the Arabs as untermenschen, and it it was only towards the end of the 1930s that uh, they really revised their view of the Arabs and they started to excise the anti-Arab passages from Mein Kampf. And uh, as they realized, you know, the advantages of building an alliance uh, with the Arabs. So, um, so by, the, by the end of the 1930s, the, the Arabs were considered honorary Aryans, if you like. And in fact, in Iran, which is not Arab, they were so eager to, to, to show their kind of Aryan credentials that, uh, that they changed the name of the country from Persia to Iran, mm. means Aryan. Oh, ah, nice? ah. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt here, be a pain. If you go back to history, Britain and Germany had been rivals for the oil, for the oil of the Gulf from about the 1890s. And the Germans allied with the Turks, with the Armenian genocide that was officered by German soldiers. Uh, Hans Grober, who was the ambassador in um, in Baghdad during the war, was involved with Gallipoli, um, organizing the Germans. There was a big, massive battle to persuade the Muslims in the British army to desert. I have a lovely card here, which if you can see, it's a British army field postcard in the war written in Urdu for all the Muslims from India in the army who were based around the Middle East. Um, okay. this, and, is, this is Lawrence, my husband. And then the <laughs> in, the, in the 30s, they started doing massive amount of propaganda. Um, so this has been something which has been building up for 30 or 40 years, mm -hmm. um, the Italians and the Germans. And I will not interrupt anymore. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, okay. And just a few comments, so Debbie's class in answer to those questions that you've answered. She says, possibly the Nazis in the Arabs shared a hatred of the Jews, which is true. Uh, Don Silverberg <laughs> says that he heard on the day of Hitler's suicide, he said his greatest mistake was not utilizing the Arabs even more. I don't know whether- Yeah, I mean, there, there was an attempt to recruit Arabs, um, uh, Arabs into a kind of army, but it wasn't terribly successful. Having, having said that, um, Arabs in Palestine, for instance, there were 15 times more Jews who joined the British, uh, that, uh, who joined the British army during the war than there were Arabs. Although, um, you know, and of course you see that pattern that mo most Arabs wanted to support the winning side. And, and when the Nazis uh, looked like they might not be winning the war, then they deserted. <laughs> but but in fact, I, I don't think I think it's a bit fanciful for Hitler to think that um, he should have used the Arabs a bit more. That I don't think uh, he could have relied on them to uh, <laughs> to kind of change the outcome of the war. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Friedman comments: It is interesting to see that Nazi soldiers were reading books on Islam and Judaism. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't Judaism. Uh, I think it said Judentum. Uh, I think it's, it's Islam and the Jews. Ah. Um, something like that, that pamphlet. Yeah, well, th those were Albanian and Mos Muslim, sorry, Albanian and Bosnian Muslims uh, in the former Yugoslavia who were given propaganda pamphlets to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and actually they behaved abominably during the war and committed quite a few atrocities. Um, okay, the next one. When they moved the Jews to the working camps, did they burn the synagogues? Uh, well, there weren't synagogues 
on the Trans-Sahara Railway, which was actually in the, in the desert. There were no synagogues burnt in, in North Africa at this time. That happened really after 1945 uh, with, with the riots uh, that broke out in, in Egypt and, and elsewhere. Um, yeah, so no, they didn't burn the synagogues. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one more from Debbie Sklar, which is, brings us to today's world. In your opinion, has Muslim immigration to Europe exacerbated the new wave of anti-Semitism? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd say I'm not very politically correct when I say this, but I, I think, um, you know, Muslim immigrants have been um, obviously welcomed into Europe without any kind of regard for the fact that a lot of them are have been brainwashed by this sort of anti-Semitism that has pervaded the Arab world in the last, you know, few decades. And, uh, you know, Jewish families are amongst the first to welcome in Syrian refugees and all this kind of thing, uh, without realizing that some of them may be out and out anti-Semites. Uh, and, you know, we've seen incidents in, in Germany where some of these recent refugees have been kind of recruited into the jihadi, um, uh, you know, movement, and have tried to attack synagogues, etc. Um, so, um, you know, I, I would, I would be rather, um, what's the word, you know, rather circumspect about welcoming refugees. Really, I mean, it, it's, it's. It, it doesn't sound good to say so, but I, I think, especially if you're Jewish, you know, the Jews, the Jews say, oh, well, we have to welcome them in because of what happened to us, you know, in the Nazi era, you know, that we were not allowed uh, to come into the West and, and this kind of thing. But I think Jews from Arab countries are much more cynical about this. You know, they say, well, look, these, these refugees, you know, they, they, they've probably been brainwashed from birth to be anti-Semites and we have to be careful. Mm. Okay, thank you. And it's over to Susan now. Susan. Um, yeah. Okay, I've unmuted myself because there's all sorts of noises going around here. So I don't they don't start again but building things happening yeah. around the place. I think, I think there's one more question here. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. What is it? Mm. Ah, we, yes, we do have another question. Yes. Yeah. One minute. Um, okay, Bulldwang. What do you think of the recent embrace of Israel by some of the Gulf Arab Muslim states? Should they be trusted? Can they really put their anti-Semitism behind them? <laughs> <laughs> That is the big question. I think we would all welcome uh, these new peace deals. They're, you know, quite miraculous in, in a way um, and, and a great achievement. But I think we need to remember uh, what happened with, with Egypt, uh, which, which did sign a peace deal with, uh, with, with Israel in 1979. You know, there was a great deal of euphoria and tourists came flooding in from Israel to see the sites in Egypt and, and it was all wonderful uh, for a short time. And then the Egyptian government put a damper on all this and now we're, we're in a very cold peace. So I think these, you have to remember that these governments are authoritarian governments, they're not democracies. Um, and they have uh, obviously strategic interests at heart when they signed uh, these agreements with, with Israel. Um, the government of Bahrain, for instance, um, has a Sunni um, elite um, ruling, ruling the, uh, the country but uh, the majority of Bahrainis are actually pro-Iranian Shiites. Mm. And so they've been trying to keep a lid on, on the unrest and, and all this sort of thing. But who's to say that the Sunni king of, of Bahrain will, will last in power? You know, he might, he might well be deposed 
from one day to the next. So, so all these agreements are, are all good in theory, but we don't know how long they'll last. Sorry to be so, so pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Yeah, so I, should, I think probably that's something similar um, in Morocco as well, isn't it? Yes, we were saying that 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 the position of the king is is quite precarious. I mean, the the Islamists are the largest um, party in the most in the Moroccan Parliament, and <laughs> um, and and the previous kings certainly have had to fend off attempted assassinations and and this sort of thing. So you know, again, they may be gone from one day to the next. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn, for a very, very interesting and illuminating talk on, on this subject, um, about which I think most of us don't know very much about. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know whether that was grammatically correct, but never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we'd, we'd also like to thank you for donating your lecture to Ezra. Um, it's really appreciated that you've donated your talk. It's been a very inspiring talk. And thank you all for attending. Um, we hope to see everybody at our next lecture, which will be on the 26th of January. We've got a few sort of holes in our programme at the moment. So the next one is on the 26th of January, when Anat Guetta will be telling us how Kva Saba was created. So once again, thank you very much, Lynn, for a very interesting talk. Thank you for having me. Thank it's you. It's a great pleasure. And hopefully you can come and visit her very, very soon. I hope so. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank um, you, thank you. Yes. Yeah. The people will